So hi guys, uh, today uh, our speaker is Professor K. Narayan from CMI Chennai. Uh, he's going to speak about cosmologies, entanglement and external surfaces. Um, this is 99th talk in the QSTM seminar series. And um, thank you for agreeing to give this talk, Narayan, and uh, you can start from your end. So thank you very much, Shantan, for the invitation to this uh, to speak at this uh, at this nice seminar series you have. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, aspects of um, cosmologies, entanglement, and extremal surfaces. This is based on um, um, uh, on on mainly these two papers here. Can you see my pointer, by the way, just to just to make sure? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So it's mainly based on these two papers and uh, other recent collaborations with. Uh, with these people. Um, so uh, I'll broadly talk about, uh, uh, this is the rough outline of the talk, so to speak, then it will become clear as I go on. Uh, I'll begin by talking about ADS cosmologies and, and their duals, and I'll review old work, and then I'll move on to describing cosmologies in two-dimensional Delta gravity theories. I'll then talk about entanglement um, in terms of classical and quantum external surfaces in these, in these theories. Uh, in the last part of the talk, I'll talk about uh, certain aspects of visitor space uh, and motivated by DSCFT, I will describe certain aspects of uh, uh, certain generalizations of the Rukak Nagi formulation of, it, of entanglement. Okay, so it's been uh, it's been nearly 25 years since ADSCFT began uh, in 97 with Maldes Sena. Um, and just to remind you, the broad idea is that holography is uh, the statement that quantum gravity in a space-time region is dual to a theory without gravity on the boundary of that of that region. Uh, it was probably written at Strings '98, uh, who first um, um, articulated this broad brush uh, statement of gauge gravity duality and asymptotic structures. So the statement is that if we have a negative cosmological constant, we have ADS-like asymptotics, uh, and these asymptotics are at spatial infinity. So in this picture, for example, this, this green um, slice here is a boundary at, at spatial infinity. This is the holographic direction, the bulk. And the dual uh, is a unit, is expected to be a unitary Lorentzian CFT, which includes time, which, uh, which goes this way, for example. For zero cosmological constant, we have flat space and we have a null infinity night structure. Um, for positive cosmological constant, we have visitor space. And this is fascinating for various reasons, but it's less clear. One might think that the natural boundary here is at future or past time like infinity. So like here, for example. So I will talk about this uh, in the last part of the talk. So in this talk, I'm so it is of great interest to understand time dependent phenomena in string theory and holography. Um, uh, and there are various open questions, uh, I think, still. Um, I will focus in this talk on two classes of questions. The first has to do with big bang or big crunch like singularities. Um, so in these cases, we know that curvatures and tidal forces are divergent. Um, the expectation is that general relativity and notions of space-time geometry break down. And so one might hope that maybe holographic or a stringy description uh, will lead to a UV completion and, and will, will lead to a, a, a deeper understanding of, of what replaces these structures. So one class of uh, um, one one class of uh, studies where this was uh, where this was investigated was in ADSCFT with time dependent definitions by me and various other people here, uh, including Shimitda, Sandeep Trivedi, and various other people, uh, Adelava, Jeremy Michelson, Suresh Nampuri, in a series of papers over this time. Um, I will review this. I will review parts of this uh, in what follows. In the current talk. And in recent work, what we've done is to try to understand uh, if we can use entanglement and extremal surfaces as probes uh, of, 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 these, uh, of these kinds of uh, cosmological backgrounds. In the, in the second part of the talk, I will talk about uh, digital space and holography. Uh, as I was saying, the natural boundary you might think could be taken to be in the far future. And this leads um, to a structure known as DSCFT, which, is, uh, which involves a hypothetical Euclidean non-unitary holographic dual. Time is uh, is expected to be emergent in this case. It's it's a fascinating thing to ask if there are generalizations of Ruta Kenagi uh, of, of the Ruta Kenagi formulation of holographic entanglement, 
with the hope that uh, one might, or the hope or the question whether decentral entropy itself could be thought of as some sort of uh, generalized entanglement in some ways. Okay. Um, so in the first part of the talk, I uh, so before I go on uh, to this first part of the talk, where I review uh, this old work uh, just very briefly on areas cosmologies. Uh, I was just wondering if there are any questions. Uh, we could take any questions if there are. If there is a question, please ask. Okay, I think we proceed. Okay. Yeah. So in this, uh, so in this old work, what we had done was to study various time-dependent definitions of of ADS CFT. Uh, so just to be concrete, uh, we have ADS five CFT uh, CFT four uh, described with this um, with this with this sort of a metric uh, with this sort of a bulk uh, uh, space time description or bulk metric, uh, and there's also a, a dilaton which I'm going to refer to as a string dilaton in what follows for reasons to become clear very soon. Uh, this essentially plays the role of the string coupling, so to speak. We considered various class of time dependent definitions where where this background. Um, Generalizes to to this class of uh, this class of backgrounds, okay? uh, and these g tildes over here, and size are uh, potentially time dependent. So a, a concrete class of examples, a concrete example to focus on, is this isotropic Kastner space time um, uh, of this kind, where uh, what we have is this time dependence here, as you can see. So this essentially means that, that as t goes to zero, there is a space like big crunch singularity. So this entire region of space basically crunches and it it, uh, it becomes vanishingly small. There's a there's a big crunch like singularity. Okay, it's space like. Uh, this whole thing happens in a space like splice. Um, now in the holographic identification uh, using the holographic dictionary, the, the gauge coupling um, is given by this. So the gauge coupling G squared Young Mills in this case is identified with e to the psi. E to the psi goes to zero also uh, in the in these class of in these class of definitions. So one might hope that, or one might wonder if this means that there is a weakly coupled CFT, okay? So which which is 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 what completes the system and allows us to march beyond uh, the singular location. And so this would be, you would think, if if this is if if this uh, works, you might think that this weakly coupled CFT dual marches on and allows us to to go past the singularity, although the bulk breaks down. Okay? So I will get to this uh, uh, very soon. But before I get there, uh, it's useful to just look at the bulk definitions themselves and this bulk and these bulk backgrounds themselves a little more. So here I presented this isotropic ADS Kastner, uh, which is one concrete class of uh, models which I'll keep using through this talk. Um, but actually, there's a there are there's a large family of such cosmologies. Uh, so here, for example, is a more general uh, uh, class of space times where we embed the entire Kastner family. Uh, into this, there are also other backgrounds like ADS, uh, like FRW versions that are embedded in ADS, ADS nuclear singularities, and also various null singularities and so on. Okay. In general, it turns out that this class of um, time-dependent deformations, um, this class of this class of deformations of ADS safety in fact, are solutions to 2B supergravity if these um, if these constraints, if if these if these conditions hold. Okay. Yeah. So my question was like. This time dependence in the metric, it looks like a similar type of radiation. Is it like similar effect? You are saying because the exponent? Yeah, this t to the power one third square. Right. So, so I don't think, yeah. so here I don't think it's related to the uh, to radiation per se. You'll see how the exponents come out uh, in what follows. So I will, I will, I, I will obtain these and also let's have other backgrounds of this kind where uh, these exponents in fact uh, end up taking very specific uh, forms and you'll see. So it is true that this exponent is in fact related to this dilaton exponent and so on also. Um, uh, but I don't think it is related to radiation per se and so on as such, uh, not any obvious way that I can, uh, that I can think of. Okay. But, but you'll see more on how the exponents come out. And so on. Sure. But it is true that these exponents are, uh, are, are specific uh, and, and so on, so as we'll see. So, uh, so this class of uh, these 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 class these families of of uh, holographic uh, of of definitions of radius safety, in fact, there are to be solutions to be supergravity if these conditions hold, and these conditions, for example, um, are relations between uh, the metric definition and the scalar definition. Um, 
So what is interesting to note is that these deformations, uh, G tilde and psi, in fact, are constrained. They are not, uh, they are not arbitrary. You have to turn them on in special ways, and that's how we've turned them on. What this suggests is that the dual CFT state is likely to be non-trivial. We have only turned on non-normalizable deformations here, it turns out, uh, in more detail. Um, it's likely that the dual state for this family of uh, constrained deformations is, in fact, non-trivial. One way to see this, for example, or one way to get some intuition about this is to note that if you look at generic severe time-dependent deformations on a vacuum state, for example, you might expect these to thermalize on long time scales. Okay, so this would be dual, for example, to a black hole, to, to something like black hole formation in the bulk. However, what we have here is a big crunch singularity. So if you want to create a big crunch singularity, not a black hole, it suggests that perhaps one has to do something special. And, and this is one class of things that, that does it. Uh, and there are also various things that, that uh, there are caveats and so on. So what this overall suggests is that, is that we can construct such, uh, such uh, time-dependent deformations which, lead, which exhibit big crunch-like singularities and so on. But it suggests that perhaps there are non-trivial, non-generic initial conditions that are required to, um, to, to, to construct such, uh, such paradigms. Okay. We will have occasion to see more, of, uh, uh, more on this in some time uh, as, as we go on. Um, now to say a little bit about the dual itself. Uh, so focusing just on this ADS-5 isotropic Gassner, uh, the dual theory here uh, by the usual rules of ADS-CFT can be shown uh, to live uh, on an isotropically crunching space. Uh, this is the boundary metric basically um, with a time dependent gauge coupling, which is given by this. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying earlier, uh, this suggests that the gauge theory dual is weakly coupled near the bulk singularity. Um, but this in a more detailed analysis turns out to not be true. Okay. So in fact, the interactions are actually important in general and the gauge theory response turns out to be singular. Um, in more detail, it turns out that the there's a singular Schrodinger wave functional and a divergent energy that comes out uh, for these classes of space-like singularities. Null singularities turn out to be better. Uh, for null singularities, it turns out that the gauge coupling is, is, uh, uh, has light-like dependence on a light-like coordinate, light-like time coordinate. Uh, here, one can actually argue that one obtains a weakly coupled uh, gauge theory. Uh, there are actually, there are possible caveats having to do with subtle renormalization effects with uh, with a possible near singularity cutoff. Um, uh, I won't describe more of this, uh, but I can talk about, uh, I can say a little more if, if somebody's interested. Um, there are various further insights that were obtained by, by these people and, uh, and other groups um, over the years. Okay, so in what follows, what I'm going to do is to not dwell more on these, uh, on, on these theories. What I'm going to do is to, is to change tracks and talk about um, um, realizations of cosmologies and cosmological singularities in two-dimensional Delta gravity theories, because that turns out to have, uh, there are more things to do there, uh, having to do with entanglement structures in particular. Okay. So I will then uh, move on to two-dimensional Delta gravity. So over the last several years, we've seen various studies of uh, of nearly ADS2 holography and the SYK model and so on. And one of the broad lessons that, that, that we've learned is that external black holes and brains uh, have new horizon throats, uh, which, 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 uh, which become ADS2 cross uh, X, where X is some, some space, some transverse space. In the IR, in the infrared, if we compactify this, this transfer space, this leads to JT gravity. This can be shown to lead to JT gravity plus matter. So the action of JT gravity, of pure JT gravity itself, is something like this. Um, pure JT gravity has been seen to be rather special uh, uh, by these people, and uh, I will not have more occasion to say much more about this. Uh, but this is this is an interesting class of studies that has been emerging. Now, in this slide, it's also true that generic two-dimensional Dilaton gravity can be thought of as a two-dimensional subsector of higher-dimensional gravity uh, on uh, some space of this kind, some two-dimensional space cross X, uh, where X is again some transfer space. If one does a compactification of this space, uh, then one leads, uh, then, then one obtains more general two-dimensional Dilaton gravity theories, which have uh, an action of this kind. Okay, where so here the Dilaton, uh, so the Dilaton in all these cases is the higher-dimensional transverse area, uh, and in in these more general theories, there is uh, a Dilaton potential which is U of pi. Okay, so here, this U of pi 
is a general potential. Um, in JT gravity, we have the special case that the, the delta potential is linear, and so we end up with, with this uh, with this sort of action. More generally, this is the kind of uh, more generally one has a more general delta potential. So just very quickly to see how this works, uh, what I've done is to look at a reduction ansatz of this kind, uh, where there's some transfer space. This space is what I'm calling x, uh, but there's some warping here. Um, and this warping is what leads to this. Uh, this wild transformation is done on this two-dimensional metric to remove the deleton kinetic term, and that's how it ends up with, with an action. Okay. So by analyzing this and uh, looking at specific examples and so on, it turns out that such generic two-dimensional uh, gravity theories are in fact more akin to high-dimensional gravity, so they're not near J2 in some ways. There's a sense in which one can uh, look at something like effective holography, where one restricts to just a subset of the bulk observers and their duals. And uh, this, this, this sort of effective holography uh, pertains to such two-dimensional theories. Uh, these are UV incomplete effective theories, so they are kind of like thermodynamic ensembles. Uh, but they are a diagnostic of the full high dimensional theory, at least uh, in certain uh, in certain cases, and they are in fact adequate for some for some aspects, including entanglement, it turns out. And we will in fact use some of these uh, in what follows. So just to give you one concrete example, um, so here is uh, is a class of uh, of theories that that could arise by studying string theory on on ADS D cross X, and if one Compactifies on X and then compactifies on the transfer space in uh, in ADS itself in in high dimensional ADS, like using an answers of this kind, for example. Then one can show that one ends up with an action like this, a two dimensional theory of this kind. If one does this for ADS D in particular, then one ends up with a dilaton potential of a very specific kind, of, uh, which 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 has a form like this. So this DI is basically the uh, compact dimensions. Di is the number of uh, is the dimension of this compact space here. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, in particular, for example, what I've done is to is to start with uh, with uh, with ADS D cross X, then compactify on X, then that leads to uh, a, 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 a capital D dimensional theory of this kind with action like this. Then one compactifies with uh, with an ansatz like that, and uh, and Di then is the dimension of this space that you're compactifying on, and that then leads to this sort of a potential. So in particular, if one does the on-shell reduction, for example, using the sort of uh, uh, reduction answers, then what, what one ends up with is, in fact, a dilaton, which has this form, uh, and a two-dimensional metric that has this form. So in fact, this metric, as you can see, is conformally ADS2. Um, so there's a so if, if di were equal to one, you would get exactly the ADS2 metric, but otherwise, you get uh, some non-trivial conformal factor. And that conformal factor actually encodes interesting properties of the, of the fact that it came from this high-dimensional compact Okay, so in particular, various observables uh, can be seen to reflect the higher dimensional theory. So in particular, for example, the holographic stress tensor or correlation functions and so on. Okay. So similar features turn out to also be true um, when there's an extra scalar, um, which then gives rise to, gives rise to uh, non-trivial dynamics. Okay. So this notice that the scalar has a, a coupling of this kind to the dilaton. So in, in here and in everything that follows, uh, it's this phi that's going to be called the dilaton. And the psi here is just an extra scalar. Um, this is the, the, the scalar that descends from the high dimensional scalar that was there. Um, so in fact, if one starts with a high dimensional scalar and does the reduction uh, along these lines, then what you end up with is this dilaton coupling automatically. Okay. So you can again think of these two dimensional theories as, as um, as basically uh, two-dimensional subsectors of the high-dimensional theory, and in what, in fact, one can show that there are interesting structures that emerge uh, by analyzing this sort of a two-dimensional theory as an approximation to the high-dimensional theory. So, for example, there are interesting things that emerge if one looks at concrete examples like uh, the reduction of non-conformal DP brains, for example. Uh, in that case, the psi uh, relates um, to the running gauge coupling, uh, which itself is basically like the string dilaton. So I will not have, yeah, go on. Question, like, uh, I can understand initially when you coupled with dilaton and did that. And, uh, now my point is you, you were actually introducing another scalar shy. So now yes. the, when you introduce, that's, that will not harm the stability of the whole system? No, so for example, um, 
so in in examples of this kind um, where one realizes uh, where one realizes jt gravity itself uh, jt gravity plus matter from uh, from the neurons and throats of extremal veins for example extremal black holes of veins you can show that in fact if you look at more complicated theories than just simple einstein maxwell um, there are non relativistic theories for example where one can do this sort of analysis and those theories also have extremal uh, extremal black holes and veins which have such neurons and adios to throats in those cases also you can argue that in fact those extra scalars that emerge uh, don't ruin the uh, ruin the adios to throat structure okay so in at least in known examples um, one can see explicitly that this is in fact true um that the extra scalar uh uh adds features but doesn't uh, destroy the structure um but this is not a general statement one has to uh, look at this um uh, and one has to keep this question in mind every time one analyzes these kinds of things certainly and, and another more thing just i want to ask like you have introduced this compact dimensions and you know, compact manifold as x okay Yes. Now, the thing is, uh, is there is a specific type of manifold you are talking about, or it, it's like in a general you just mentioned? So, um, in uh, in this class of theories, for example, right, if one looks at uh, type two B string theory, for example, on on uh, on this sort of a space, ADS D cross X, uh, say for example, ADS five cross X, the X could be any of these. Uh, you know, one ends up with an uh, You, you can look at, for example, any of these ADS five cross X five type manifolds where X five is some sort of Sasser Kenstein type manifold or something of this kind, um, and compactifying on that will still lead to uh, effective five dimensional theory of this kind. Yes, and 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 that's universal then, uh, even in just even in this five dimension. So in the same way, if one looks, if one starts off with n theory on on uh, ADS four cross X seven, where X seven is some um, Some space that is that that is either S seven or more complicated than S seven and so on. One can still end up with uh, under reduction of those seven uh, of that seven space. One could still end up with an effective Einstein action of this kind in four dimensions. Then one compactifies further on the on the on the spatial part of the ADS itself, and then lead and that then leads to this two dimension theory. So of course now if one keeps track of of the full theory, there is more structure here. um so this theory is not all that it is you get this two dimensional theory plus various other matter and so on which the couples with that in very specific ways as we know um so so that's why that's the sense in which i was saying that this theory is is really a ue incomplete theory and one should really if you want if you want to understand the full structure one should really look at the full compactification um but this two dimensional theory in itself is also good for various things uh which is uh, and and that's all that i will be focusing on in in, in this talk thanks thanks so um so there are so just to return um the scalar here uh, adding an extra scalar here of this kind leads to various non trivial dynamics and uh, in particular um one ends up with this sort of uh, this sort of an action where where um where this dilaton coupling uh, to this extra scalar comes from the reduction of this high dimensional uh, of this high dimensional scalar action and examples of this are in fact reductions of non trivial dynamics um so it's it's an interesting question to ask whether one can use these two dimensional dilaton gravity theories um uh, as interesting playgrounds uh, for for a big crunch or a big bang like uh, singularities and whether one can gain something from this this is especially important in the context in 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 the light of recent uh, investigations of of entanglement and quantum mechanical surfaces and so on so i will get to that So concretely, what we have in mind is to start with some higher-dimensional uh, cosmologies and then do a dimensional reduction. And this is certainly one way to get uh, get a two-dimensional theory, which admit, which we know for sure will admit cosmological singularities and cosmological theories in general. And if one does that, um, it turns out that one can obtain um, uh, a lot of mileage. Uh, and in fact, we did that, uh, and we did more. so in this uh, in this work with uh, with uh, with these people uh, what we had studied was uh, was in some ways the most minimal such uh, two dimensional theory where we have uh, two dimensional dilaton gravity plus a dilaton potential that can potentially couple to the that can possibly couple to this extra scalar also and this extra scalar and this extra scalar comes with this dilaton uh, coupling uh, which came from the reduction of the scalar itself in higher dimensions okay now 
just remind you again, so this phi here is a two-dimensional dilaton, which is just a higher dimensional practice area. So the equations of motion look like that, and they are what they are, and they carry on, they, they exhibit rich dynamics. But we would like to understand whether one can obtain big crunch or big bang-like similarities. So in order to do that, towards doing that, we'd like to understand, we'd like to make this, uh, uh, there's a simple point to make, which is that near the big crunch singularity, we expect rapid time variation, uh, which is what leads to the divergence, uh, which is what leads to the singularity in the first place. So you might think that time derivatives, therefore, are the dominant terms to keep in these equations. Okay, so if you do that, then it turns out that uh, there is a universal structure that emerges, and uh, the equations of motion basically boil down to just these terms. Okay, just just these terms which involve time derivatives themselves, uh, because they are the dominant ones. So this is universal in the sense that the dilaton potential, as you can see, which governs the asymptotic structure of this of this theory, has disappeared. Okay. So what this is saying is that no matter what you, what sort of dilaton theory, dilaton gravity theory you start off with, with, uh, with, uh, with whatever this potential might be, uh, and that captures various classes of asymptotic structures, uh, and I will have, I, I will mention this uh, quickly, uh, very soon. So whatever sorts of asymptotic structures you start with, the near singularity structure has has a universal sort of behavior, and uh, this these equations can in fact be solved, and they suggest this universal subsector. Okay. Uh I have yeah. so I, I can see that this uh, phi is basically also time dependent. Yes. Later. Now I can see this extra scalar has a kinetic term, but it didn't be included in the kinetic term of the dilator. Why this is so? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't get that last part. I repeat that, please. No, I am saying that uh, in this action where you have written uh, with two scalars. Yes. Dilaton and the other scalar psi. So yes. you have a kinetic term which is phi del psi square. So my point is why there is no uh, kinetic term on the free phi dilaton. Yeah, so actually there is. So it, it's actually there uh, secretly in these equations of motion. So this action has been written down in a in in just a nice way just to normalize with various conventions. Um and this is basically done uh just for convenience, so to speak. Um so recall that we did a dimensional reduction of this kind with the sort of an ansatz, and then one obtains a metric which looks like which looks like this metric. Then, for convenience, we also carry out a wild trans. We also perform a wild transformation of this metric uh, of this kind. This then absorbs the the kinetic terms for the dilaton into uh, this into this region scalar. Okay, so it's kind of a rescaling you did. That's why. Yeah. So it's just it's just it's just for convenience. Uh, the actual structures uh, do encode the time derivatives and so on, um, and and they're all there. Okay. So in fact, if you actually look at the equations of motion themselves, you can actually see that all the derivatives are actually there in the in the. Yeah, yeah. That that's why actually they have asked that. You have I... to do the yeah. So you have to just you know this this action is written in in a way that is convenient uh, for various purposes, but that's all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So here, what we've done is. Is we look at the near singularity structure uh, and focusing on just dominant time derivatives, we end up with this sort of uh, uh, this sort of uh, uh, near singularity structure, so to speak, where time derivatives are dominant. This this looks universal in the sense that the dilaton potential appears to have disappeared, um, and this leads to a universal subsector. Um, this is very suggestive uh, because it looks like there are very specific exponent structures that emerge. Um, to do more, one can in fact uh, construct a scaling ansatz of this kind uh, for these for the various two-dimensional fields. Um, this higher-dimensional cosmology is then written in uh, in terms of these two-dimensional variables, and that's that's what this parameterization is. Um, the fact that this uh, the fact that we use a scaling ansatz in the equations of motion means that uh, ends up implying that we end up with just algebraic equations for these exponents. These exponents uh, meaning these exponents. So these give you a collection of algebraic equations, which we can just solve for these exponents, and they give you various families of cosmologies. So in fact, one can then recover uh, this isotropic ADS class that I was talking about earlier, uh, which is uh, which is this space basically in higher dimensions. Under this reduction, what we end up with is a two-dimensional theory which has uh, which has a dilaton of this kind with this linear time dependence, uh, this universal piece that we just saw. Uh, and these exponents, these time exponents, um, which govern the, the the big crunch behavior of the two-dimensional metric, uh, are related to uh, to the scalar, to this extra 
to the exponent of this of this extra scalar. Okay, they're very they are very specific relations uh, that they have that have to be satisfied. So in particular, you can see in, uh, that this metric exponent here uh, and these, in fact, satisfy this relation. So there are very specific things that emerge from this looking at these equations of motion and the constraints um, that arise as algebraic equations on these exponents. Okay, so here uh, is this isotropic class now written in this two-dimensional um, language, and this is the two-dimensional background that corresponds to the reduction of this isotropic class now. Um, although we know that this came from the isotropic Kastner via dimensional reduction, uh, this two-dimensional background can be thought of as an independent two-dimensional cosmology in itself uh, from just this uh, from just this um, effective action. Now, there are also actually various other families of cosmologies. Um, so, if one just looks at flat space, uh, which has just a, a vanishing uh, dilaton potential. Uh, one can show, one can find new cosmological solutions which uh, which which map to the reduction of mostly isotropic Kastner. These are straightforward. They've also been known before, but there are also many other things that that turn out to be the case uh, that turn out to emerge from this analysis. So uh, it turns out that one can find um, what we call hyperscaling violating cosmologies, uh, where the dilaton potential uh, has this more complicated form. Um, and uh, I will not have occasion to dwell more on this, but uh, I just want to mention this. Uh, I don't think these have been known before, so we found them by by the sort of uh, scaling ansatz and uh, and this two-dimensional um, uh, machinery and this two-dimensional analysis. There are even more complicated uh, cosmologies having to do with uh, with hyperscaling violation uh, violating Lipschitz boundary conditions, uh, where there's a non-trivial Lipschitz exponent. Also, these are even more constrained and complicated, and uh, I will again not have occasion to talk about them. Uh, okay, so uh, I will now uh, begin to talk about entanglement structures in these in these theories. But before I go on, um, if there are any further questions? I'd like to. Uh, there's a good place to pause and take. Okay, so um, entanglement. As we know, as we've known over the last many years, is a useful holographic probe. And uh, in the current context, uh, we'd like to explore the behavior of high dimensional extremal surfaces with regard to the big crunch singularity, in particular, focusing on ADS clusters. Okay. So, um, what we have in mind is a strip shaped subsystem, um, which is the natural uh, symmetry structure, which is, the, which is the natural class of subsystems. Uh, Relevant, uh, which are consistent with the symmetries of the space of this kind. So I'm going to first talk about entanglement structures in this high-dimensional, uh, in this high-dimensional space, in high-dimensional radius class space. So this strip-shaped subsystem will lead to a four-dimensional two uh, classical RTLHRT extremal surface, uh, which will be parameterized by uh, by these functions. Now there is time dependence in the background, which then means that the surface automatically dips into the time direction also besides the radial direction. So here, for example, is a picture of this, uh, of, this uh, uh, of, of this situation. What we have is, is, uh, is, the, is the following. This is the bulk direction. This is, uh, this is the boundary. Uh, this is the boundary. Um, the singularity, the, the, the big crunch singularity somewhere here, way over, way in the, way in the top. Uh, represented by this dashed line. Here is an anchoring uh, time slice, which is T naught, and we imagine that there is um, there is a subregion that I'm going to represent by this by this small blue thing here that you can see, like this, for example. Okay. Uh, the time slice that the constant time slice that corresponds to this anchoring time slice is this is this gray plane. Um, this is a picture of this extremal surface, the red, this red thing. So this, this extremal surface basically starts here and goes in and comes back. I've suppressed all the other spatial directions uh, just to illustrate the time dependence in this, uh, in this case. Uh, time goes upwards in this thing. So this is the cartoon of the extremal surface uh, that we have here. Okay. So, here is a cartoon of the local geometry near this turning point. So this turning point is basically the place where the surface goes in and comes back. Okay, so the surface doesn't dip beyond a certain point for a fixed 
for a fixed subregion size, for a fixed this size, for example, the surface only goes in so much and comes back. Okay, so if you increase this, then the surface goes in further and so on. This is the intuition that we built up and this experience we built up from, from analyzing um, the Ruta Kinagi formulation in EDS. Uh, so I'm referring to the turning point as P star R star. Um, so it turns out that as long as you're not anywhere in the vicinity of the singularity, so if you're in the semi-classical region far from the singularity, then the time dependence is, 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 is slow, the time variations are, 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 are slow. So we expect that extremization in this semi-classical region is reliable because nothing goes wrong. It's, it's all nice classical, uh, uh, classical extremal surfaces and so on. Okay. If you do this analysis, it can be done in great detail, it turns out, in these backgrounds. Um, then we find that the surface lies almost on a, on a constant time slice. Uh, and it, in fact, bends away from the similarity. So in fact, this is the, this is the depiction that I've, that I've tried to uh, illustrate in this cartoon. So had the surface light uh, uh, lay, uh, light on a constant time slice, then the surface would have been on this gray slice. But instead what happens is the surface bends in time also, and it bends away from the singularity. So it, it bends, uh, so the singularity is somewhere here, the surface bends this way. So there's a lot of explicit uh, analysis that can be done here, but I will not uh, go into this in great detail unless, I'm, uh, unless there's a specific question. Uh, so we can also show that the extremization exhibits uh, this maximum type structure, a spatial minimization, and uh, a maximization and a time maximization. Uh, if you take the area functional and extremize um, with respect to, um, there are two functions here. Uh, so if you extremize with respect to the spatial direction, then what you get is is an expression like this, um, and this shows this bit scaling that I was saying earlier. That if one increases this the size of the subsystem on the boundary, uh, the width is larger than the turning point is. Is further in the surface dips further in. Okay. The time extremization equation ends up being more complicated uh, because the time dependence here uh, makes things more complicated. But it turns out that analyzing the semi classical region can be done and it's quite reliable, it turns out. And then one can show that there is an approximate uh, solution to this time function, which looks like this, where these coefficients basically are, are suppressed by powers of this, uh, of this, of the, of the anchoring time space. So if you're far away, from the from the singularity, then t naught is large, uh, and then these these pieces are, sup uh, are suppressed, and that's the statement uh, um, of the fact that the that the time slice is almost constant, that that the surface lies almost in a constant time slice. If you analyze this more, it can be shown that in fact uh, the location, um, the value of this of this uh, of this time function at the turning point, in fact, is always um, uh, larger, is always further away from the singularity than than the the slice to anchor the surface on. Okay, so um, so there are many details here, but I will not go into this unless somebody has a question. Um, and uh, I will now move on to the study of quantum extremal surfaces. Um, if if there are no further questions on this, but there's a good place to pause for any quick question. There's a question, please ask. Not 90%. Yeah. OK, so I will move on um, to, um, to quantum extremal surfaces. So as we know, there have been exciting recent developments in the black hole information paradox. Um, there are new insights from the generalized entropy and the corresponding behavior and the location of quantum external surfaces. Okay. An important technical statement is that two-dimensional CFT techniques can be used to adapt the calibrasic RD formula uh, for entanglement entropy uh, in two-dimensional theories to quantitatively describe the subleading bulk matter contribution to the ent entropy. And so here is a general expression for the generalized entropy. So this ends up being the classical area piece, and this is the bulk matter entropy. So in all these recent investigations, um, there's a question on what the role of the black hole interior singularity is. In practice, it turns out that all the action stays away and the singularity appears to play a uh, little role. Okay. Um, 
this is a space like cosmological singularity and as such we expect large stringy or quantum gravity effects here and so semi classical approximations you might think will break down and uh, and that's that but perhaps studying simple toy models uh, will help us in how this is probe or avoid cosmological singularity and hope and this is um, uh, and this is part of what we will explore in uh, next uh, in this talk so just to give you a sense of of um, of what this generalized entropy is like uh, so here is the generalized entropy that I was talking about and uh, i'm going to just lay out some specific things which 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 are which are uh, uh, which are going to be pertinent to uh, to the to the discussion that follows so here is the classical entanglement piece the classical area piece um, and this what i've written here is the bulk matter entropy uh, and i will describe this uh, soon the delta squared here is the space time interval um, and this overall object is what we extremize uh, to find the quantum external surface okay i've only retained terms that are relevant for extremization here so let me just say a little bit about what what this means and i will also give you a few simple examples to um, to illustrate what's going on so this generalized entropy pertains to this uh, to the two dimensional theory firstly uh, that we obtain from the dimensional reduction of the higher dimensional space so earlier i was talking about uh, higher dimensional uh, uh, extremal surfaces uh, higher dimensional rt hrt surfaces um, this generalized entropy here pertains to just this two dimensional theory um, that we obtain from the reduction of that higher dimensional space. So this therefore means that necessarily the subsystems here are the full space. Okay, the quantum extremal surface then is a point in the two-dimensional space, which then means that we are we are essentially looking at the infrared limit of the higher dimensional uh, RTHRT surface. So the surface wraps various transverse directions, and all of that is wrapped and uh, and 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 goes away in this dimensional reduction. And uh, in a sense, this quantum extremal surface is like the turning point uh, in, from the point of view of the higher dimensional analysis. Now, above, we have assumed two dimensional CFT matter for simplicity. Um, we are taking this to be in the ground state. Uh, now, this is reasonable if we are far from the singularity because we expect time variations are small. Then, this expression uh, that you obtain here is the, is, uh, is the entanglement entropy for, for a single interval uh, for two dimensional CFTs. Subject to this conformal transformation that that uh, that maps the two-dimensional CFT from a flat space to a curved space of this kind. Okay, so this 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 expression itself follows from the replica uh, the replica formulation of of the entanglement um, as uh, as has been discussed in all these recent investigations, beginning with uh, Almari et al. Now, in addition, we will impose this regime of validity for for the for 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 using this uh, expression of generalized entropy which is that the central charge of this two dimensional cft uh, is going to be much greater than 1 uh, but it's also going to be much less than 1 over g okay what this is saying is then that the classical area term um, this term is going to be dominant but s bulk will be appreciable finally if this S bulk term overpowers uh, this classical entangling term, the classical area term, then the Bekenstein bound uh, is violated. Uh, and this then leads uh, uh, to, what are, to what are being called islands in, in the recent literature. This is using the formulation of Hartman et al. in this, uh, in this work. Um, so this is a, a broad brush uh, uh, nuts and bolts of, of this of the structure that, that we have. Um, and uh, and I will talk about specific examples uh, where where we will see how the structure uh, ends up coming out. Okay. So it's useful to look at some simple time independent examples uh, just to build some intuition for for the kind of thing that uh, that we are saying here. Um, so here, for example, uh, since it's all time independent, everything is on a constant time space, and, and so. What this is saying is that we have some anchoring time slice and uh, and everything stays on the constant time slice. So t is equal to t not above. The space time interval um, is then just just this just this first one. Okay, just this. So I will focus on this ADS uh, 
uh, DR plus two reduction that I mentioned earlier, uh, just to build some intuition, uh, because we know how this works from the high dimensional point of view. And so it's useful to see how this comes out from this two dimensional perspective. So here the dilaton has this form and the two dimensional metric is, is like this. The generalized entropy can be written down by, uh, for a single interval, can be written down just using these expressions then. Uh, and you can see that you get this leading term and this the bulk entropy terms which is this. This whole thing is just a function of one variable, the radial coordinate now. And so if one extremizes, what you find is, is this expression here. And to find the extremum, we have to set this uh, to be an extremum. So this, so this derivative vanishes. So you can now see that both these terms are negative. Uh, since C is positive, the central charge is positive and DI is greater than one. Um, this is some high dimensional theory that, that, uh, that has been dimensionally reduced to obtain this two dimensional theory. Okay. You can then see that the only solution to this extremization is in fact, um, R star goes to infinity. Okay. R star is the, is the extremal value of R at, uh, uh, on this extremization. And so you can see that since both these terms, um, are positive, there's a relative plus sign. So the only, the only, uh, thing that satisfies this, the only solution to this extremization is R star goes to infinity. So this recovers the usual Poincaré wedge, which is the usual ADS DI plus two entanglement wedge. It can be shown that this structure exhibits uh, uh, the maximum structure that I was referring to. You can see that in fact, this, um, uh, this is a spatial minimization. Now, what is interesting is that one can recast this generalized entropy in this fashion. And in this form, it is, it is clear that as long as the dilaton phi is not too small, this S bulk is subleading to the classical area piece. So this thing goes like log phi, whereas this thing goes like phi. And so the subleading bulk matter piece, the bulk entropy piece is always subleading to the classical area piece. So there can never be competition between these two terms. And so the Bekenstein bound is not violated. And so there are no islands in this case. Um, there are other examples where one appends a flat space region to uh, uh, beyond the boundary of this of this ADS region and so on, and then there in fact are islands, and you can show that that is the case. Uh, but in this class of theories, what we are doing is is to look at uh, theories with this ADS boundary stuck in, and uh, and that's all. Okay, so here is a picture of the kind of thing that I have in mind. I'm going to now talk about uh, uh, two-dimensional big crunch similarities where I do the same sort of analysis. Uh, but this is a picture of the kind that, that also shows what happens in this ADS space. Okay, so R star goes to infinity is the entanglement wedge here. And this basically is um, saying that this quantum extremal surface in fact lies on this, on this, uh, on this boundary here, uh, all, the way in, all the way in the interior. So I'm now going to talk about the uh, two-dimensional big crunch singularities, focusing on this ADS class reduction just for simplicity. Um, so it's important to note that there are no horizons in these, in these cases. So all the complications that, that are there with the black hole, uh, information paradox are not there a priori. There are other things that emerge and I will comment on that very soon. Um, for simplicity, I will assume that the quantum extremal surface, um, uh, is maximally space-like separated from this boundary observer. So I'm going to focus on this boundary observer that that's there here on the ADS boundary. Um, I will assume that the matter, uh, the, the bulk matter is in the ground state which is reasonable far from the singularity, as I mentioned earlier. Under these assumptions, it can be shown that the generalized entropy, which has this general structure, in fact, uh, reduces to this form. So this form is, is, is the same as what I was saying here, uh, happens in this time independent case, but even in this time, uh, even in this time dependent case, this ADS Kastner case, it can be shown that uh, for these specific special assumptions that, uh, that this generalized entropy in fact takes this form. The dilaton here, of course, is time dependent. And so that leads to more complications and then we'll see how those work. Um, but now again, once we set up this, uh, generalized entropy functional, one can again extremize to see what happens. Um, uh, and in this picture, for example, the quantum extremal surface will be the solution to the extremization of this generalized entropy. Uh, and it's basically going to be denoted by a point here. The entanglement wedge then is, uh, is this, is the part of this causally connected to this. 
the singularity is way above here at t equal to zero, and we are doing we are doing again everything in some semi-classical region far from the singularity. Extremizing now, uh, you see now this thing is a function of time and space, and so if we extremize, we extremize with respect to time and with space. So the extremization with respect to time uh, takes this form. And the extremization with respect to space takes this form, it turns out. Now, again, you can see that both these terms are positive. So C is positive because we're talking about a, a bulk matter CFT, which is which is uh, which has positive central charge. Di is greater than one. And so these, these two terms are both positive. So again, you can see that the only solution to the extremization is if both these terms separately vanish. In other words, R star goes to infinity and T star goes to infinity. Now this condition uh, where T star is less than R star comes from the fact, comes from the requirement that we also have to satisfy this extremization, which means that this term should not overpower the extremization, the, the vanishing of this, of this term. Okay, this is then saying that this T by R cannot, T star by R star cannot be too large. Okay. So what does this mean? What this means is that the quantum extremal surface is driven to the semi-classical region far from the similarity. Okay, so we are uh, the singularities over here uh, at t equal to zero. The quantum extremal surface is driven to a semi-classical region far from the singularity. Okay, way over here. So another way of saying this is that the entanglement wedge excludes the, ne the near singularity region. Um, there's a question about what uh, about whether there are islands, uh, and this is something we are still thinking about uh, in this context. In some ways, this entire near singularity region is excluded. So, uh, so in some ways, this is uh, uh, this is not part of the entanglement wedge. Okay. So it turns out that this uh, structure is also consistent with previous studies of closed universes with no entanglement, with some auxiliary region or um, um, some some flat region beyond the boundary uh, over here, or with some auxiliary universe somewhere else, and so on. Okay. Now, I mentioned that. This expression arises under these assumptions. If we relax this assumption of maximally space x separated, you get a more complicated expression. It turns out you can analyze that and you can still show that these conclusions will hold. Uh, they also hold in other two dimensional cosmologies where uh, there are certain conditions that hold on these, uh, on the time and space exponents in, in the Peloton and, and E3. They are not general, uh, but in, uh, in various other cosmologies, various other two dimensional, uh, two -dimensional cosmologies where certain conditions hold, uh, this sort of structure is true. In other words, that the entanglement wedge excludes the near singularity region. So, well, what have we done to step back? We have analyzed the generalized entropy and found um, the structure of quantum external surfaces. We find that they are driven to the semi-classical region. Um, what this is saying is that the analysis that we've done is in some ways consistent. The two-dimensional cosmology that we are that we've been using here is a reasonable approximation to the higher-dimensional cosmology because we started off with some higher-dimensional cosmology. We did a we performed a dimension reduction down to two dimensions, keeping only certain modes, uh, and then we find that those modes are adequate for this entanglement analysis. The quantum extremal surface remains in the semi-classical region, so it doesn't go to a region where there's high curvature or something. Um, so this suggests that the two-dimensional analysis, the two-dimensional cosmology is a good approximation to the high-dimensional system. Okay. But it also begs the question about whether uh, there are better models for the near singularity bulk entropy, uh, whether there's more stringy entanglement in some ways. So to another way of rephrasing this whole analysis is that we start off with 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 a, with a cosmological similarity. We 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 stick in bulk matter in, in the ground state, far from the similarity, and then we evolve that, and that leads to this structure where the resulting quantum extremal surfaces are also forced to lie in the semi-classical region, far from the similarity, um, which is not in the academic wedge. But you might think naively that maybe the nearest, maybe the vicinity of the singularity is a highly excited region where there's a lot of uh, a lot of excited states, a lot of um, a lot of entropy. And so from that point of view, you might think that maybe this is not capturing all that. Okay, so you might want a better model for, for the for the near singularity bulk entropy. And this is something we're thinking about. Uh, 
this also dovetails with the question of uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, right in the beginning, about what the initial conditions might be in the semi classical region apart from the synthetic. So I think there is something here to be understood uh, better, uh, and hopefully over time we will understand that. So this concludes the first part of this uh, of this talk on ADS cosmologies and quantum external surfaces and so on. Uh, in the next part of this talk, um, uh, which is, uh, I, I will talk about um, aspects of digital space and so on. But before I go on, uh, uh, I'd like to open up questions on this. Any questions or comments? So please do that. Sorry. Otherwise, can I proceed? Okay. So in this, in the, in this uh, last part of the talk, I will talk about um, about aspects of digital space and uh, and certain generalizations of external surfaces. Um, uh, and the Ruta Gunning formulation in this case. So, uh, this is the structure we've been seeing overall in this very broad brush way on, on, on holography. So, we have spatial asymptotics here for ADS is the kind of thing that I've been talking about. For digital space, uh, we get something completely different. It might appear that the natural boundary is at future or past time like infinity. So, here, for example, at I plus. This suggests a, a, a spatial or a Euclidean CFT, um, which is a very different structure. Okay. So DSCFT uh, is 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 a conjectured statement that there's a dual Euclidean non-unitary CFT on this piece of the boundary, which might be naturally taken to be at future or past time like infinity. Um, so here is is a picture of DSCFT space. We have a sphere that's uh, so if you look at constant time slices. These are spheres. They are crunching and growing in time. <clears throat> so if you look at this dashed line, uh, if you look at one of these dashed lines in the top half or the bottom half, um, can be described by this Poincaré uh, coordinates, these Poincaré slices, basically. Uh, if you look at both of these uh, dashed lines, then these are static. Uh, these can be described by static by the static coordinate system, which I'll come to very soon. Um, Soon after, after Strominger and Witten uh, described DSCFT in this way, uh, Maldison and his famous paper on non Gaussianities uh, argued that the entire structure of DSCF, this, that this entire structure of DSCFT can be obtained by analytic continuation of this kind uh, from Euclidean ADS. Um, the formulation involves the Hartle Hawking wave function of the universe subject to early time boundary conditions. And the precise dictionary is that the wave function. Universe is equated with the partition function of this hypothetical dual CFT. Okay, to see how this works, so it's 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 useful to note that this is very different from the kind of thing that we see in ADS, where Z CFT is Z bulk. In other words, we equate the partition functions of the bulk and the boundary theory. Here, what we are doing is we start with uh, we equate the wave function of the universe uh, subject to certain uh, early time boundary conditions. With the partition function of the dual safety, of this hypothetical dual safety. So, to see how this works, uh, focusing on DS4, four dimensional DC space, the wave function in the semi classical approximation for probe massless scalars takes on a form like this. So, it, it, it looks like a, it, it looks a bit like a Gaussian. Um, uh, these phi zeros uh, are basically boundary values of the, of the, of the bulk. Of the bulk scalar of the bulk master scalar boundary values over here at, at, at late times. Um, from the usual differentiate dictionary of ADS CFT, one can then construct dual CFT correlation functions by just using the differentiate dictionary where we differentiate respect to the sources and then we find um, boundary correlation functions. So here is, is the two point function, for example. If one applies this to the energy momentum two point function, uh, that you might obtain from the dual to uh, to appropriate graviton modes, which behave like massive scalars, then you can see that in fact you obtain a, net, uh, a central charge that's negative. Okay, so that, that negative sign basically comes from this this sign here, and it's tied to the fact that this this wave function has this Gaussian type structure. But this negative central charge basically means that this this 
there's a ghost CFT like structure that that is suggested here, so to speak. Okay. Now this was exemplified in these uh, in in the higher spin context by these people. Um, this is as far as the boundary structure is concerned. Bulk expectation values, on the other hand, uh, look like this. Uh, to uh, to construct bulk expectation values, one would one would need to um, construct this sort of an average where where one sticks in the probability, the bulk probability, where mod psi squared is mod is psi star psi, and the fact that psi star and psi appear in these bulk expectation values means that the dual involves two CFT copies. Okay, it suggests that the duals, the fact that psi star and psi both are appearing means that there are two copies of the wave function that are required, and so the dual uh, likely involves two CFT copies. Okay. So this is going to be important in, in what I uh, in, in what I say uh, in what follows. In the static uh, coordinate system, um, which is which is the best, which is which is perhaps the most appropriate way to see these super entropies. Um, we use these uh, the, the metric of this space looks like this, and uh, in this case, n and s um, are these northern and southern diamonds, these left and right, uh, these left and right regions. These regions correspond to zero less than or less than l in this in this in this space. These are static patches, and these patches t this coordinate t here is time, and it it has a translation symmetry. Okay, so so. So these dash lines appear like event horizons for observers in N and S. Okay. Decent entropy then is the area of the cosmological horizon. So it's fascinating to ask if decent entropy can be thought of as some sort of entanglement of entropy. Okay. So towards understanding this, um, one speculative generalization of Ruth to uh, of the Ruth formulation to decent space. Might involve the analog, the bulk analog of setting up entanglement entropy in the dual CFT. Okay. So we restrict to some boundary Euclidean time slice, um, just like we do for, for um, uh, in, in, in area CFT. We take constant time slice and we set up subregions and then we um, reconstruct the bulk external surface and so on. In the same way, here, one might imagine we define some Euclidean time in this, in this Euclidean CFT uh, and we restrict to that boundary Euclidean time slice. We then restrict to four dimension two RT HRT surfaces, which are anchored at I plus, which is the natural boundary here, and they dip into the holographic time direction. Okay, so here is what what is is a possible uh, picture of what might happen. You think uh, you might think. So the surface starts here, goes in, and then maybe it returns. So this is in the future universe. This is uh, surfaces anchored at I plus at the future time boundary. Okay, so to analyze this in 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 more detail. <laughs> Um, one can change coordinates from here, from from this um, um, to this, and then the metric now, the, the space now looks like this. Tau here is bulk time. Okay, uh, so so you can see now that as tau goes to zero, we end up with uh, we, we end up with the the boundary of uh, of, of this curve. This is i plus. Now, if you analyze uh, using this, one can set up this extremization problem in, in great detail. Um, and it turns out that one can then show that there is no real I plus to I plus time. So in other words, the surfaces start here, but they don't return to I plus. Okay? So this, this sort of thing never happens. That's it. So one might think maybe they end instead at I minus. Okay? So these surfaces keep marching on, and maybe they end here at I minus. If this is true, then this would suggest that there are real extremal surfaces that stretch from I plus to I minus. And maybe this is in sync with the fact that bulk physics um, requires two boundaries. Okay, so in fact, um, one can actually do this in great detail. And what we find, uh, what I found, uh, is this sort of structure. So in fact, one can set up the extremization problem um, and look at the area functional on the boundary Euclidean time slices. So one can choose what boundary Euclidean time slices one wants here. Uh, there are all these different isometries. And so we take any of these equatorial planes, all the equatorial planes are equivalent. So in the sphere, one takes one any, any of these equatorial planes, say some SD minus two. The surface then starts here. Um, and then and then we set up an optimization problem for this, and we then analyze. Um, 
extremization shows uh, these expressions come out. And then this, if you analyze this in, 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 in detail, it, it turns out that what you end up with is these future past surfaces that go from I plus to I minus. They stretch from I plus to I minus. In a little more detail, you can actually see that these, in fact, are just rotated analogs of the Hartman Maldesimus surfaces that there have been known for some time in the ADS black hole. Okay. So, uh, for these surfaces, there, in fact, is a real turning point, but it's not anywhere here, it's actually here. So, these surfaces start here, go in, then they turn around here somewhere in the in these northern and southern diamonds, then they go back to I minus, okay, then they go on to I minus. There is a limiting surface, it turns out, if you analyze this in, uh, in some more detail. So as this, so this is the region uh, on the, on this, uh, this is a subregion uh, on the boundary at I plus. As the subregion becomes a whole space, um, it turns out that this surface doesn't go all the way in. There is a limiting surface. The surface can only go so much. Okay? It cannot penetrate all the way into N and S. It can only go up to here somewhere. So there's a, this, this is a critical value of, of tau star for DS4. You can show this, and it's also to higher dimensions, but I'm going to stick to DS4 now. Uh, for these kinds of limiting surfaces, um, one can show that the finite part, uh, in fact, has linear scaling with the subregion size. Okay, so in some ways, it is related to the linear uh, growth in time of entanglement for these hartman maldesimus surfaces. Uh, all these surfaces have an area law type divergence, uh, which looks like this. And so the structure shows that um, all these uh, that that these that the area law divergence and the finite part, in fact, scale like this entropy. In some ways, if these surfaces existed, the scaling is automatic because they're all four dimension two. And uh, so the question, so the interesting observation is just that these surfaces exist and they they stretch between uh, the future uh, boundary and the past. Boundary. Okay. So this scaling suggests that this entropy in, in some ways is like the number of degrees of freedom in the dual CFT. Um, so these surfaces turn out to have various interesting features. Um, so one can construct these surfaces for generic subregions. Um, here I'm constructing them in uh, with with the requirement of what I'm calling top bottom symmetry. So you can see that these surfaces uh, have this reflection symmetry about this line. So the top and the bottom parts um, are symmetric in some ways. So all of these lie on some S2 equatorial plane. I'm restricting to just DS4 now. So all of these lie on some equatorial plane, um, some S2 equatorial plane. These endpoints here at the left and right edges are disconnected. Um, the fact, so in other words, the, the left surface goes from here and goes to I minus, but it doesn't ever connect with, with this right end of this, of, this, uh, of this thing. So the area therefore is also this disconnected uh, uh, is the sum of these two disconnected components. And you can show by analyzing this, in, you can show this in great detail that given a certain subregion here uh, at I plus, uh, there's a unique future past surface. It turns out. Okay. And this essentially boils down to the fact that there is no I plus to I plus turning point. The surface starts here, but it can never go back. One can analyze this in more detail, actually, it turns out. And if one uh, looks at two disjoint subregions, um, here I'm drawing these, uh, I've, I've drawn these four points, and W1, W2 is one subregion, W3, W4 is another subregion, and they're disjoint. Uh, one can construct their future past surfaces along these lines, uh, and you can then show that strong subarticity, in fact, is saturated. Um, if one analyzes uh, the area of these, of this, of this, of the subregion A union B, it just turns out to be uh, the sum of the areas of A and B itself. Okay, so mutual information in fact vanishes, and this is reminiscent of well-separated subsystems in finite temperature, um, uh, in a finite temperature ADS, uh, in finite temperature ADS. Here. So this, in some ways, dovetails with the fact that this space has a temperature, and uh, uh, and so you might think that there is some sort of um, a decoupling of this kind that will happen. Um, and, and, and I think this is the fact that this mutual information is vanishing like this is a reflection of this, of this fact, but it'll be nice to understand this in a deeper way. There are also further interesting properties, it turns out. Uh, so since uh, we have decent isometries, all these S2 equatorial planes are uh, in fact equivalent. 
So one can construct the union of such four-dimension two surfaces and obtain a four-dimension one envelope surface, so to speak. Um, so here is a picture of 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 this. Uh, we start with uh, we start generic subregions, and um, and this suggests a picture of this entanglement bed, so to speak, in this context. Um, this is basically the co-dimension zero bulk region that's enclosed between the external surface and the boundary subregion. So it's basically this interior, this this shaded region. Basically. Okay. So in some ways, this is the interior of this co-dimension one envelope surface um, that I mentioned here. One can do this uh, for generic subregions also, and you can see then that the entanglement wedge defined like this is bigger than the causal wedge. Um, this is. Uh, something that we have experience with in ADS safety, but it's also, it seems to also be true here if the entanglement wedge is defined in this way. If we consider multiple subregions and the corresponding top bottom symmetric future past surfaces, then there's an analog of subregion duality uh, where we see that the bulk subregion here is in fact dual uh, to this boundary subregion. So this bulk subregion maps to the uh, to this boundary subregion and so, for example, here, this middle boundary subregion um, over here uh, is due to this middle bulk. There are various other features also that fit. So, everything that I've written on this slide is basically is, is mostly from geometric intuition. It would be nice to understand this in a deeper way uh, from DSCFD or by some of the structures. So, what are we seeing here? We are basically seeing real connected future past surfaces that stretch from I plus to I minus. Um, so this suggests future past entanglement in some ways between I plus and I minus. And you might ask, what does this mean? Okay. So the obvious speculation is uh, that comes to mind uh, based on what we know from the eternal black hole and, and the thermal field level formulation is that DS4 is perhaps approximately dual uh, to two copies of the CFT, uh, copies at, at the future and the past in a thermal field double like entangled state, which looks like this. Now, bulk time evolution maps I minus to I plus. So all states here will be mapped by bulk time evolution to states here. So you might think that therefore, this sort of a thermophile double type state is in fact uh, unitarily equivalent to uh, a thermophile double like state that is in two dual CFT copies that are solely at I plus. Okay, so we take this CFT uh, at the few, at, at I plus alone, and we construct two copies, and um, there's a thermophile like state that 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 we construct like this. Okay, this is a sort of obvious speculation that emerges from the existence of these of these future past surfaces. Um, it would be interesting to understand this better, I think, uh, and it's something I'm thinking about. Now, from the point of DS4 CFP three, the dual is a ghost-like CFP, as as I was uh, as I was saying earlier. Uh, Mainly because of this negative central charge that comes out. This therefore leads to an obvious question about whether there are entanglement like structures in ghost CFTs and ghost like quantum mechanical systems. Okay. Um, now, such ghost like theories have negative norm states. And so you might, you might ask how are these uh, uh, how, how are these negative norm states contributing? And if there are negative norm states, then how would one identify positive non subsectors, positive subsectors of entanglement entropy? Because the bulk structure here is all positive. Okay. So I'm going to talk about this very briefly now. Uh, but before I go on, uh, uh, this is a good place to pause to see if there are any questions on this, on the on this bulk uh, external surface structures. Any questions or comments? So, towards studying entanglement in ghost theories, um, it can be seen, in fact, uh, and I did argue that um, these replica type arguments of Calabrese Cardi can, in fact, be generalized to C equal to minus two ghost CFTs. Uh, one, you, you can show that, in fact, there are analogs of the replica calculation via the two stop to point function. Um, that can be, in fact, um, uh, studied in great detail for C equal to minus two ghost theories. And that then automatically leads for single intervals 
to a negative entanglement because of the negative simple charge. Okay. These rely on certain specific properties of of um, uh, of, of these equal to minus two theories, um, but I won't dwell on that more. Uh, there are many subtleties in the septic arguments and so on, but um, it would be nice to understand if there are simpler structures uh, where there are more simpler quantum mechanical systems where one in fact can understand these ghost like theories and, and their entanglement structures. Okay. Um, so, in fact, towards that, it, it is interesting to note that, uh, that an object like a ghost pin can, in fact, be hooked up. So, this is simply a two state spin variable with an indefinite norm. So recall that an ordinary spin has has uh, has a structure like this. We have an up spin and up spin, and a down uh, which has uh, which has overlap one and 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 down down is one and so on. A ghost spin is defined as I, I define a ghost spin as a two state spin variable with an indefinite norm, where up up and down down are zero, but up down is one and down up is one. These are these octagonal inner products in the state space. This then automatically means that if one defines uh, these combinations, <clears throat> you can manifestly see that there are negative non-states. Okay. So it turns out that if one studies infinite ghost spin chains of certain kinds um, with certain kinds of nearest neighbor interactions uh, in the continuum limit, they can be shown to lead to the BC ghost CFT uh, family. Uh, towards understanding entanglement structures, um, it turns it, it, it's instructive to look at just two ghost spins and see that if one constructs a two ghost spin state of this kind and constructs uh, a density matrix from that <laughs> and then carries out a partial trace over one of the ghost spins, one obtains a reduced entry matrix for the remaining ghost spin. This leads to a, to a generalization of the one Neumann entropy for these cases. And uh, the norm of such a state looks like this. You see, there's all these interesting minus signs that appear um, where whenever there's a single ghost, uh, whenever there's a single minus minus ghost spin, okay, whenever there's a single minus component to the state, um, to this to, to this to the state, okay. What can construct the reduced entry matrix by tracing over by doing a partial trace, uh, but with this indefinite ghost spin metric. One can then construct the analog of the one entropy by by again doing trace row log row, but Again, with respect to this indefinite uh, ghost spin metric, and there are new structures that emerge now. So this turns out to be an analog of um, uh, of, of 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 entanglement for these for these ghost spin like theories. Uh, and in general, you can see that positive norm states um, do not lead to positive reduced entry matrix and positive entanglement, mainly because of these these minus signs that are there. So in other words, you can take a state which is overall positive norm, but you can break it up. Uh, to construct a reduced entry matrix which has components with with various signs because of this, and so this then leads to uh, non-positive structures. Okay. Um, so in fact, in general, because these negative norm contributions, the eigenvalues of the reduced, of the reduced entry matrix uh, in general can be complex. So how does one find positive structures here? <laughs> one uniform way in which we found. Uh, Positive structures emerging is to entangle identical ghost spin copies, um, uh, entangle identical ghost spins from each copy. So we take two copies of, so here there are two copies here. So if you if you entangle identical ghost spins from each copy, then this uh, necessarily leads to positive norm and positive reduced entry matrix entanglement. So already you can see this here, for example, so if you take the state and you look at its norm, restricting attention to just this subsector here, you can see that we are entangling identical. States here, so we we are entangled plus we are entangling plus with plus and minus with minus. <laughs> this turns out to automatically lead to uh, a positive uh, a, a positive structure. Okay, so these are what we call correla uh, correlated ghost spins, and it turns out that these uh, these sorts of objects, in fact, end up with uh, with a with a completely positive uh, reduced entry matrix and a positive entanglement. Okay, so in fact, this is also true for two copies of ghost spin ensembles. It turns out, and we can show this in in, in, in detail. Um, now, if you look at this structure, this structure looks a lot <laughs> like like this. So, in some ways, these future past surfaces uh, are indicative of, uh, or at least they are suggestive of this sort of uh, of this sort of positive structure in 
in entanglement in those theories. Okay. So uh, it would be nice to understand all of these structures better. And uh, this is one of the things I'm thinking. This is some of the things I'm thinking about. Um, so I will now conclude. Um, so as we've seen, generic two-dimensional Dalton gravity uh, theories can be uh, employed gainfully uh, towards understanding uh, various things. So in particular, in the ads kasner case, uh, we studied classical extremal surfaces, which are anchored in reliable uh, in the reliable semi-classical regions, and we find that they bend away from the singularity. Quantum extremal surfaces also are driven to the semi-classical region, far from the singularity. So, so the singularity is not the near singularity region is not in the entanglement wedge. This leads to obvious questions on on better models for the bulk matter entropy and and uh, and a better understanding of the initial conditions in the semi-classical region. So there's an obvious question here about which classes of big crunch singularities are in fact accessible via entanglement. And what happens to the black hole interior singularity? Now it could be that this, that the, the black hole interior singularity is qualitatively different from a big bang or a big crunch. And it'd be interesting to understand these, um, these questions better. In the DCTA context, um, uh, these distant future past extremal surfaces appear to be a way to organize bulk entanglement and there are various features that fit in, uh, like this limiting surface, vanishing neutral information, um, and, and the notion of entanglement wedge and subregion duality, and so on. Uh, this suggests that thermal field double like entangled state of two CFT copies of the future boundary, and we'd like it would be nice to understand this in a deeper way and interpret this in a better way. And there are interesting questions having to do with quantum extremal surfaces in this context. Okay, so I'll close here. Thank you. Thank you, Naran, for your talk. If any question is there, please ask to the speaker. It's not, I just want to ask one, just one clarification, not maybe related to directly whatever you said, but you know that there are certain works are going on like Recently, there is a paper by Subrat on this uh, massive graviton. He said uh, should exist for this island proposal. Could you please comment on that a little bit? So I don't have any um, uh, anything obvious to say on that. Um, so. All those questions on, uh, so I, I think part of the central point might be that that the black hole case with horizons and so on might be qualitatively different from these things that I've been studying on the big crunch uh, and and these kinds of cosmological similarities. So the, the notions of of the entanglement wedge and the way they appear might just be different. Um, and these questions on um, uh, in the cosmology context might just be different. So this, this, these notions of islands and so on in the cosmology context, I think need to be understood better. Uh, that's the most basic statement uh, that I can think of. And um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure I have anything uh, more in, intelligent to say on this at this point. Yeah, like I just saw this paper, like I'm trying to understand this, what is going on. Anyways, uh, thank you for this contribution. It will be uploaded in my channel and I will share the link with you. And uh, yeah, in the later half of the talks, like next talks, you may also join. I, I saw that in the last talk you have joined for this. Yeah. Yeah. But like, it was very big talk. That's why I think you left a little bit early, uh, but it actually I, was yeah. two and a half hour or more than that. Okay. So yeah, anyways, no problem. But like, if you are interested, you can join. I will share the details further. What about, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, I, I would suggest there is a lot lot of people out there but they left actually. But anyways, you gave a very nice talk. So please, uh, if there is anybody, please unmute and give a clap for him for giving such a nice talk. And you may contact him if you have any question. Uh,
Is that okay? People will contact you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You will contact him because this talk will be posted if you have any further questions or comments or any clarification. You may ask him or maybe you can discuss with him. That would be very good. So thank you and stay safe and healthy. Uh, you this too. is very important and uh, yeah, nice to see you and hope to nice. see you again in my future talks as well. Thank you. Bye. See ya.